Hello and welcome to Business Standard. I'm Venu Santu. Let's take a look at the stories for the day. Cash-strapped GoFirst has now been granted bankruptcy protection. The airline is seeking a comprehensive debt restructuring and its planes might hit the runway soon. But will the future come with clear skies for GoFirst or will there be more turbulence ahead? Also, what do the latest developments mean for India's civil aviation sector? Here's a report by Bhaswar Kumar. Your summer plans to jet off to a vacation may not be hit too hard since the elevated airfares seen in the wake of Go First cancelling all its flights until May 19th may not last as long as was previously feared. That's because Go First is expected to restart flights by May 24th. However, it will do so with 23 aircraft instead of the 27 it was operating till May 2nd. The Vadia Group owned airline has informed the Civil Aviation Ministry it would be able to restart operations in two weeks and is mobilizing funds. It had filed for voluntary insolvency before the National Company Law Tribunal on May 2nd and stopped its flights from May 3rd. Go First had also officially suspended the sale of tickets till May 15th. Finally, on May 10th, the National Company Law Tribunal accepted Go First's insolvency plea. The ruling allows Go First a moratorium of six months. During this time, the airline will continue to be in possession of the nearly 45 of its 55 aircraft that were to be taken away by the lessors. Experts say that with the lessors not being able to take possession of the aircraft, the airline may have a reasonable chance to resume operations. The NCLT also appointed Abhilash Lal of Alvarez & Marcel as the Interim Resolution Professional or IRP to take charge of the airline. Regarding the NCLT order, Go First Chief Executive Kaushik Khona said that it was a historic ruling that would prevent a viable airline from becoming an unviable one. But has its flight towards revival taken off? And will it be smooth or turbulent? There are many challenges for Go, Go First going forward, even during CRP. They are in custody of these aircraft, not as owner, but as a under lease agreement, which has other obligations, also corresponding obligation to pay rentals or lease rentals and other dues as per the terms of the lease uh, agreement. So even if they have custody, their liability, and this liability continues during CRP period. There is no moratorium on, on uh, liability which are incurred during CRP period. There is moratorium on recovery of pre CRP uh, dues. So it's a very, very challenging time for even uh, for IP of Go First or lenders or COC committee to keep the operation afloat. Uh, it will require a huge amount of cash resources to be pulled or put in, uh, whether the COC will be willing or whether any interim finance financer will be willing to put this money in a airline which is already facing such a uh, difficult uh, uh, phase of its operation. It's very, very, I think I am not very optimistic about this. Experts say Go First will need more funds from either its current promoters, the Vadia Group, or new ones to clear its dues. Despite the Vadia Group injecting close to 6,500 crore rupees in the airline since its inception, it has not been able to keep itself afloat. In its application to the NCLT, Go First said that on April 28th, it was in default of payments of 2,660 crore rupees to aircraft lessors and 1,202 crore rupees to vendors. Go First had said it filed for insolvency because faulty Pratt & Whitney engines had grounded about half of its 54 planes. The airline had won an arbitral award in Singapore against PNW, directing the latter to supply 10 serviceable engines by April 27th this year and 10 each month till December. According to GoFirst, PNW failed to comply with the arbitral orders. And GoFirst has reportedly initiated enforcement proceedings against PNW in the US. Meanwhile, a PNW spokesperson has said that the allegations by GoFirst are without merit and PNW will vigorously defend itself. For his part, the interim resolution professional has also been directed to pursue the arbitral award.
the future fate of GoEd depends and begins and ends with what Pratt and Whitney is willing to support. Right now, it makes no sense for GoEd to change the engine option to go for something else, like like at least Indigo managed to do because. 90% of Goa's revenue fleet is the Neo, whereas Indigo still has the older CO aircraft, which are far more reliable. Following the insolvency plea by GoFirst, on May 3rd, the shares of Interglobe Aviation, SpiceJet and Jet Airways witnessed a surge. It was expected that Go's rival airlines, like Akasa Air, would also look to gain its market share. Now, with GoFirst likely to resume flights on May 24th, how things proceed on this front will depend on whether or not GoFirst can find more funds, deal with the engine issue and address staff concerns. But amid the troubles at GoFirst, what does Indian Civil Aviation's future flight plan look like? From a medium to long term perspective, it does not bode well for the industry when there are repeated insolvencies. This leaves the industry in a state where there are few players with Tata Group and Indigo controlling more than 80% of the market and Tata Group having a monopoly on business class travel in domestic sector. In such a situation, it is always better from the pricing and service standpoint that there is healthy competition. An airline such as GoFirst, which has a proven legacy and branding, should not be allowed to seize operations. GoFirst will also have to retain its pilots, who have been offered jobs by rivals, particularly Air India. Meanwhile, its lessors are seeking the quashing of the NCLP order, saying that it can't retain their aircraft. In fact, on May 12th, the National Company Law Appellate Tribunal will hear the plea filed by one of them, SMBC, in this regard. Meanwhile, Bengaluru Airport has been ranked among the most punctual airports in the world in 2022. It bagged the 20th spot in the list by Sirium, an aviation data analytics company. Bengaluru, which is India's IT capital, has been the driving force behind Karnataka's economic growth and also of the countries. Karnataka, which has seen eight chief ministers since 2008, is also India's third largest state economy. Now, as the people of the state wait for the new assembly, after a historic 73% turnout, Debagyo Sanyal finds out if there is more to the numbers than meets the eye. In the news for recent assembly elections, Karnataka has been a politically turbulent state where just three chief ministers were able to last their full five-year term. But that didn't stop the southern state from turning a new leaf and achieving stability on the economic front. The state's economy has grown faster than the national average in the last few years. When the gross domestic product or GDP fell due to the first wave of COVID-19 in 2020-2021, the rate of concentration in the state was much slower than the all-India figures. According to Karnataka Economic Survey 2022-2023, the state's economy is estimated to have grown by 7.9% in 2022-2023 compared to India's GDP growth rate of 7%. The share of Karnataka's GSDP in all India GDP is estimated to reach 8.2% during 2022-2023. Per capita income in Karnataka at current prices is estimated to be 3 lakh rupees, nearly double the national average of rupees 1.7 lakh in 2022-2023. The state is among the four top-ranking states in India in terms of per capita income in the last five years. And when it comes to drawing the highest foreign direct investment or FDI, Karnataka left Maharashtra behind to grab the top spot in 2021-2022. It drew $22 billion, accounting for 37.5% of total FDI received by India. Maharashtra was behind at $15.4 billion. 
However, the state could not sustain the pace in the first nine months of 2022-2023 and Maharashtra again emerged as the top-ranking state in terms of FDI, attracting $10.8 billion, followed by Karnataka at $8.8 billion. The state's unemployment rate is also lower than the national average. The rate stood at 3.2% in 2021-2022 against 4.1% at the national level in the same financial year. Moreover, while at 6.7%, the national inflation rate stood above the Reserve Bank of India's upper tolerance band of 6% in 2022-2023, it was a bit lower at 5.5% in Karnataka. But most experts point out that Bengaluru's tech and service sector-led economy is a major driver of Karnataka's growth story. This over-dependence on Bengaluru also hides several problems behind Karnataka's growth. The manufacturing, uh, as far as the innovation is concerned, uh, the Karnataka has done very well. And, but at the same time, the infrastructure is quite poor in the um, uh, Karnataka for uh, this innovation to get uh, you know translated into manufacturing and then uh, uh, become prominent and uh, the rural economy does not unfortunately figure very much in this growth story agriculture in um, Karnataka depends on uh, uncertain rainfall when it comes to lending it is uh, it has performed very poorly and then much of the deposits that are mobilized in Karnataka they go elsewhere Growth story of uh, Karnataka has been very impressive in the last half a decade or one decade. But this growth is mainly confined to service sector. The service sector in turn is confined to Bangalore and then the rural areas do not quite figure in this growth story. Major drivers is undoubtedly the information technology uh, industry. And... Uh, but that brings with it a problem with Karnataka's growth, and that tends to be very Bangalore-centric. So the uh, emphasis is on Bangalore, and if we look at the at the share of Bangalore, even in terms of population, not just uh, GDP, it, it increases massively. Uh, it has been increasing massively over the last two decades and more, and particularly in recent years. And that Bangalore-centric growth puts pressure on the city, and as the as, as pressure increases on the city, its ability to attract capital and grow further is also impeded. So you're really dealing with a situation where growth is concentrated. Can such a concentrated growth with the pressure it brings on the city's infrastructure be sustainable? The prime driver of Karnataka's economy is therefore also its biggest challenge, the Silicon Valley of India, Bengaluru. And employment seems to be at the heart of this issue. In a worrying trend for the state, India's IT capital, Bengaluru City, has seen a 22% decline in voters in the 20 to 29 age group from the previous election. In the absence of the decennial census, experts feel this could indicate a slowdown in the state and its inability to generate enough jobs to retain its workforce and is a cause for concern much beyond the current elections. But what does this imply for the state's larger economic portrait? Uh, I think uh, lack of employment opportunities for educated youth and then uh, and even if there is some employment that is not really satisfying the aspirations of the youth in uh, Bangalore. The second important thing is that uh, the migrants uh, migration is uh, mainly into either construction or uh, to the gig economy. And then uh, this is uh, again uh, throwing its own challenges in terms of uh, the imbalance between uh, wages and social security and then uh, the civic communities that are there in the uh, state. And finally, I think uh, the poor service delivery in Bangalore. That basically you do not have an ability to absorb people. And I don't mean just at the workplace, which is in terms of employment and therefore you have these temporary options like gig workers. But it's also in terms of the city as a whole. People therefore come to the city for short terms and then go back. And in that process, it affects the way they can leave agriculture also. There's no permanence to the movement to the city, which means that you need to retain your agricultural land, even if it is not viable, just as an insurance. I think the idea of land becoming fallow and then becoming uncultivable is a major problem that the Karnataka government realizes. 
you have an uh, agriculture that's becoming less viable. You have uh, the option of urban work becoming just a matter of gig works and therefore uh, a, a great deal of temporariness. And therefore you go back to other options available in the rural areas. And if that is also a challenge, you're under a, a, severe, a severe crisis. Experts believe, therefore, that while Karnataka has done quite well on several crucial economic markers, its economic growth is driven almost wholly by its state capital. This has not only strained the urban economy of Bengaluru, but has also rooted the state economy in a lopsided dependence over service sectors and taken focus away from rural agrarian sectors. Moving on to financial markets. U.S.-based investment firm Invesco recently slashed Swiggy's valuation to $5.5 billion, nearly 50% down from its peak valuation of over $10 billion. This also coincided with a new delivery platform, ONTC, spreading its wing in the domestic market. All of this sent Zomato's shares down 5% between the 9th and 10th of May. But is there more pain ahead for the stock? Will Zomato's valuation also come under threat? And what should investors do amid the ongoing uncertainty? Nikita Vasisht answers these questions in our next report. The rally in shares of food delivery company Zomato has come to a halt. After surging 31% from its March lows of 51 rupees, the stock price has dropped around 5% over the last two days. The decline came against the backdrop of ONDC, a government-backed delivery services provider touching the milestone of 25,000 deliveries per day. Moreover, as customers took to social media to highlight the near 50% drop in their bill amounts, nervousness crept into investors' psyche about Zomato's dominance in the food delivery business. And analysts expect this nervousness in the stock price to continue in the near term. VK Vijay Kumar of Geojeet Financial Services, for instance, says food delivery orders are being increasingly placed via ONDC, so it could emerge as a strong competitor to Swiggy and Zomato. Until further clarity emerges on the new player, Zomato's stock may remain subdued. ONDC, or Open Network for Digital Commerce, is a government-backed initiative allowing online businesses to sell their products directly to customers without the intervention of a third party. Analysts feel the growing clout of ONDC may threaten Zomato's market leadership in the long run if more restaurants partner with it. Uh, the commission is that Zomato charges about 15 to 20 percent depending on the restaurant that fundamentally uh, can be brought down by ONDC, where ONDC will cap the commissions. The first point. The second point is the user data that uh, Zomato and Swiggy do not share with customers with restaurants. That will change when ONDC really comes in and ONDC wants to share data with uh, the uh, restaurants. So these are two fundamental points where uh, restaurants uh, were not really very happy with Zomato and Swiggy and that's why ONDC solves this problem. Uh, but uh, with Paytm on board and everybody having Paytm, the restaurant onboarding will be uh, better and far more easier than, uh, than uh, people expect. That apart, analysts fear once ONDC scales up across product categories, it may impede the expansion of take rates. This, they said, could potentially delay Zomato's timeline for achieving profitability. Against this backdrop, the company's lofty valuations are being questioned again. They have to compromise on the margin. So, I firmly believe that uh, all the such companies, including Zomato, the valuation multiple will be revised downward by the markets. See, you want, they are not making profits at all. At all. And it is going to take uh, several years for them to make any profit. So, even now this is, I still believe that this is absurd valuation. So, there has to be at least you know, 15-20% uh, uh, correction in the valuation budget. Chokalingam suggests investors should use any uptick in the counter to book profit. Overall, gains in Zomato's stock are expected to remain capped in the near term with developments around ONDC's plans doing the rounds. The next key trigger for the stock 
would be its Q4 FY23 result, which is scheduled to be announced on May 19th. On May 12th, March quarter results and India's retail inflation data for April will be tracked by investors. After markets, let us turn our attention to privacy. Messages and calls are end-to-end -end encrypted. No one outside of this chat, not even WhatsApp, can read or listen to them. If you are a WhatsApp user, you are sure to have read this message on your contacts message window. But have you ever wondered what it means to have your messages end-to-end -end encrypted? We decode it for you. End-to-end -end encryption or E2EE is a type of encryption where a message is encrypted at the sender's end and decrypted on the receiver's end. The message remains encrypted at all points during the transit, so even if someone intercepts it during transmission, they cannot read its contents. The encryption and decryption of the message happen only at the endpoints, the sender and the receiver end. The message is not encrypted or decrypted at any point in transit. Even the server relaying and storing your messages cannot decipher and read them. E2EE uses asymmetric public key encryption where both parties have two keys. Here the term key refers to the mathematical algorithm used to decrypt or encrypt a message. One of the keys is the public key that anyone can access while the other is the private key that is not shared with anyone else. The public key is used to encode a message and this encoded message can only be decoded using its corresponding private key. Simply put, it's a double lock system. When somebody sends you an encrypted message, their app uses your public key to encrypt the message. The encrypted message is sent over the internet, however, the public key can't be used to translate the messages into its original form. To do that, you need your private key. This is possible because the public key and private key are linked in a way that is nearly impossible to figure out when looking at the public key alone. Besides securing your messages and ensuring privacy, E2EE also helps those working remotely to access company tools and data securely. However, E2EE isn't a perfect security solution. If an app's communication is fully encrypted, that can prevent the app from offering additional features like contextual services based on the content of the message or the ability to automatically generate calendar invites, message history and other additional features. Moreover, while E2EE does help protect the content and data of your messages, it doesn't encrypt the metadata. Thus, even if the content is encrypted, it's still possible to determine who you sent messages to and when. Law enforcement agencies in the US and European countries have also argued that E2EE provides text messaging applications such as Telegram, WhatsApp, Apple Sign Messages, Jabber and Signal, or even Facebook Messenger from monitoring illegal activities on these platforms. I will Nation's trusted bank, SBI, the banker to every Indian. Despite the drawbacks, end-to-end -end encryption has quickly become an industry standard across messaging apps and social media platforms. And now Elon Musk has said Twitter could soon be rolling out encrypted messages as part of a bouquet of new features and services. That's all for today. For more news and analysis, please log into our website, business-standard.com. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.